yeah, the, the F of reinvention, uh, yeah, the, 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 the title and the description of the talk were very cryptic, but the, uh, basically the title of the talk is The Fun of Reinvention, and we'll get to that in a second. But, but first, I'm really honored to be here. I mean, I'm really excited. First time in Israel, and it's kind of, kind of fun to be out here. Uh, as far as the picture on the slide, um, one of my kids is, is trying to make a video game. And this is the character from the video game. Um, it's a little hard to describe, but that's, a, that's a, apparently a guinea pig with wings riding a skateboard playing electric guitar with like a pink mohawk of some kind. Um, I, I, I look at that and it's like, well, I guess if I have to follow a rodent going places, I guess I'm going to go with that one. I mean, that one seems, uh, <laughs> seems a lot of, like a lot of fun there. And, and, and really the, the, the talk with this talk it's about really kind of just the fun of Python a little bit. Uh, a little, little bit of history on this. Um, it also turns out that this week is essentially the 21st anniversary of me giving a talk at a Python conference. Um, I first spoke about Python at the fourth international Python conference to 60 people. So that's, uh, it was about 60 people showed up. It was held out in California at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, the picture in the background was the huge fusion laser out there. We got a tour of that and it was, it was very cool. Um, sort of my, my exposure to Python, I came to it through um, the route of supercomputing. So I was doing a lot of stuff with physics, computational science, and basically everything was painful about that. I mean, it was this, just this horrible experience of like C and Fortran and batch scripting and, and all this stuff. And we sort of brought Python into this, um, discovered about it reading in a physics magazine. Uh, Paul Dubois, who is since long retired from the Python community, had written an article about it. And we sort of saw that and we're like, oh, that looks awesome. And in, in the experience of doing that, it was just this awesome, fun project. I mean, I, you know, I, I think about, oh, God, that was really fun doing that work. And I sort of think about, like, well, why was that so much fun to do that project? Um, and I think there were sort of a number of factors to it. Um, one was just the fact that we were sort of reinventing everything that we were doing. I mean, it was like we were taking this really painful process, completely putting a new spin on it. And it's just fun to do that. You know, it's fun to kind of rethink things. But there were also facets of Python that were sort of great too. I mean, um, one of the things that we loved about Python is that it seemed very playful. I mean, even, even like simple things, the fact that you could have the REPL and just sit there and type commands we thought was cool. I mean, you know, the fact that you could just interactively um, do things and just get immediate gratification we thought was awesome. I mean, it was, you know, keep in mind, I come from the world of C, right, where it's like you had to compile everything, and it's like super painful. Uh, the, other, um, the other thing that was really neat about it is there was, was very much kind of a do-it-yourself kind of, kind of ethos to it or a aspect to it. Python really let us um, build a lot of tools by just kind of gluing kind of random things together. I mean, it, as, as an example of this, um, a, lot of, you know, a lot of the work in Python, I was at you know, the national lab where the typical solution to a problem was to throw money at it. Like we had a lot of problems like visualizing data. And so their solution to the data analysis problem was, well, let's just buy a million dollar silicon graphics machine and you guys can use it. And it turns out that was totally ineffective. And what was effective was sort of building our own little skunk works visualization tool by kind of ripping apart this program called XV. I don't know whether anybody, has anybody ever used XV? It was this old like X Windows program for visualizing stuff. We took the code for that and kind of ripped it apart and put a Python interface on part of it and did some sockets and we built this whole visualization system. Keep, keep in mind this predates any of the cool tools that you have now. I mean, there was no matplotlib or anything like that. So you had to really kind of roll your own. Uh, some, other, um, some other things we really liked, liked about Python is that it was just totally magical what you could do with the language. I mean, sure, the, the, like the, the REPL was cool, but it was also really cool that you could get your hooks into the language and modify it to your own evil whims. So even, even something like this, um, you know, like you have like a container class, you know, the fact that I could make one of those things and then... Um, and it, it assumes that I can type here, um, and then hook into it, we just thought that was awesome. I mean, essentially, you could make Python kind of do whatever you want. And this was actually a key for a lot of, like, early 
playing around with Python, like array processing libraries and like hooking Python up to C code and Fortran codes and, and stuff. You could bend the language and kind of adapt it. So that was, that was pretty cool. The other, um, the other interesting thing about it, it was highly unpopular at the time too. Um, so at work, we got a lot of pushback because we were using Python on supercomputers. And there was sort of a feeling that that was not appropriate. Like that, that was not a real programming language. What are you doing? Doing supercomputers? You know, why don't you use Fortran? Why don't you see? Um, I gave a talk about Python at the supercomputing conference in the U.S. This is a, a conference that draws about four to five thousand people, and my Python talk was in a room about this big with uh, twenty people. So. Actually, if you give a talk and nobody shows up, it still might be important. So keep that in, keep that in mind there. Uh, also, uh, just, just giving talks at various places, we also got a lot of kind of uh, interesting responses. I gave a, I remember giving a talk at Stanford at one point about halfway through the talk, this computer science professor kind of chimes up. He's like, Mr. Beasley, could you give me a formal definition of a scripting language? And I'm like, what is that? What kind of question is that? I, th I think I responded, um, I know it when I see it, which was not, that was not a good, good answer. Uh, uh, then, you know, another, another place, uh, you know, I gave a talk at NASA and somebody at the end, they were like, how did, how did you get permission to do this project? And I'm like, permission? We didn't ask permission. That, that didn't go over more well uh, either. So, so anyways, there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of qualities there. Um, but then there's this, this passage of time, okay, so you have this fun project. Time passes, and there's sort of a feeling, you know, if you, if you program long enough that your fun kind of project sort of turns into this. Um, you know, I have a, I think this is this picture of it. It's, it's like a ship, shipping ship, shipping, shipping ships. I don't know, went, went around recently, and I, I've put a whole bunch of Python version numbers on there, and, I, and, it, and, it, and it's like, okay, I've got my Python program, and you've got Python 2, and Python 3, and Python 1.5, and all this, all this stuff, you know, it's like, what happened to your, to your fun project? Uh, to be honest, you know, the Python 2 to 3 thing, there, there are some issues there. I mean, uh, it's not, not, not exactly the easiest transition, and people love to, love to gripe about that. But um, one of the things that I, I do spend some time thinking about is can you go back to that, that earlier day? You know, can, you, can you get back into like, the fun of reinventing things and not, you know, not worry so much about like, the Python 3, 2 thing and, and other things? And I guess the, the reason that I've been thinking about this is that lately I've been working on some projects of, of different sorts. I mean, maybe you've seen some of these, like the, like the Curio project is something I've been working on. I've been working on some parsing projects. And I've just been having like a tremendous amount of fun with it. I'm sitting there in my office, and I'm just thinking, God, this is so cool. Like it reminds me of what I was doing 20 years ago. And in thinking about the, the reason why, I honestly think it might come down to Python 3.6. I mean, we're doing some stuff in Python 3.6, um, and I'm just kind of amazed. Uh, you know, it, it, Python 3.6, if you haven't used it, is probably one of the most major Python releases that has ever been made, a sh a short of Python 3, as far as just new features and new cool stuff. And so, in thinking about this talk, I was, I was like, I should just do something cool with Python 3.6. You know, just kind of like, just throw out all the rules and do this like P Python 3.6 talk. Also, I'm kind of vamping on the 21 year aspect. So in, in, the, in the US, when you turn 21, um, that is when you can first legally drink alcohol. And usually it is a highly reckless, horrible experience on like all, all accounts there. But it's a bit like, you just sort of throw all caution to the wind. and. And, and you have that. So I, I, I thought, huh, 21 years of Python, I should just do this like recklessly irresponsible Python talk here of, of live coding and other, other things. So, so probably the, the, the most insane thing to do during a talk would be to write a framework from scratch or something. So we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to do that um, in, in a second here. Um, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, write it, write it. I guess that's the other F framework. Yeah, okay. Um, and then, and, and just as a pref uh, preface before doing this, um, if you're going to do anything that follows here, call it a prototype. 
<laughs> everybody, everybody has that standard disclaimer of like, well, don't do this at work. I'm not going to say don't do this at work. I'm just going to say call it a prototype. Um, that, that was actually a standard strategy back in the 90s. Um, if you wanted to get your work to accept Python, what you would do is just call what you were doing a prototype, and you just say, yeah, 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 we'll rewrite it in C++ later. <laughs> and then, you know, you get the whole thing working and realize that it's going to cost like $50 million to rewrite in C++, and it's like, oh, no, no, it works fine. It's not a, not a prototype anymore. Okay, so, so a little dis disclaimer there. Um, and then the other thing that we need to do before we write this framework, I thought I would talk about two things that you can do to put old Python out of its misery. Like, if you really want to get rid of the old Python. Um, so one thing that you can do is start using f-string. This is my bad, dead parrot on the top of the gravestone there. So if you haven't seen f-strings before, they're just awesome. I mean, it, essentially, it's a new way to do string formatting in Python, where you can kind of embed uh, in var variables in there if you um, enclose them in curly braces. But F-strings are actually much, much cooler than that. Um, one of the things about F-strings is that you can also put like expressions in there, like that. So that is, that is sort of beyond what you would do with sort of normal, normal string formatting. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, you can also put things like, um, like modifiers in there. Like if you wanted to change the, um, I don't know, like change the formatting in, in, in some way with like, like padding characters or something, you can, you can do that. If you really wanted to make people kind of mad at you maybe, um, one, one other thing you can do is, is even put like F-strings inside of other F-strings. <laughs> this is going to test my, my, my skills here, but the, um, if you do different quoting, you can, you can, you can do that. I, I'd probably just like spare that, you know, maybe don't. Don't go down, down that route. But, but if, you, if you do use f-strings, um, you will pretty much guarantee to, to kill off every prior version of Python. It's not even syntactically correct in anything be before Python 3.6. So that's, um, that's one tool for, for doing that. Actually, I think I maybe had programmed f-strings too much before preparing the abstract of this talk. Like, you know, if you look at the description, it's like the F of the F of the thing. I was just doing, doing that. Um, the, other, um, the other thing that you can do if you really want to go modern is you can rely on the fact that dictionaries are now ordered by default. I don't know whether you, um, whether you knew this or not, but if you, uh, if you put things in a dictionary, they preserve their order. So if you, if you make a dictionary and then convert it back to a list, it goes back in the order that was created. I have, to, I, have to, I have to warn you, I saw a talk from PyCon where Brett Cannon um, warned people at least like four times not to rely on this um, in, in your code is like not a guaranteed feature of the language. Um, and since I'm not a core developer or on the PSF, I'm telling you that you absolutely should rely on this. I mean, it is the, 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 it's awesome, and the only way to make it a required feature of the language is to rely on it. So and I don't think Brett is in Israel, so I'm a little, little safe at the moment. But yeah, okay. yeah, we're it prototype. It's a prototype, exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right. So those are the, the two things to start. Got to cleanse the palette of Python two, and like relying on dictionaries being in order and f strings is one really great way to, uh, great way to do it. Um, but then, but then what we have to do. Let's think about this, this framework that we're going to build. Okay, so the, uh, I, I guess I should say, you know, where do you want to go today with this, um, this, this, this framework? What I'm going to start with is um, this GCD function. Okay, maybe not the most exciting function, but um, basically computes greatest, greatest common divisor. Uh, one of the things that you know about Python is that it's pretty freewheeling concerning things like data types and type checking and other things like that. Um, and you can call this function with inputs that might not make sense. Like you could do it floating point numbers. Um, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Maybe the, the, the difference between Python 2.7 or, the, or the, the greatest common de de divisor of 2.7 and 3.6 is almost zero. Maybe you can read something into that. Uh, and maybe, um, you know, maybe you can pass in strings or something, and then you'll get kind of cryptic error messages. 
this is the kind of thing that you see when it's like four o'clock in the afternoon and somebody's not converting data off of a web form correctly or something and then you're getting like extremely cryptic error messages. So, so the thing that we're gonna, we're gonna think about here is what you could do to fix the problem. So, and you know, pe people look at that and they're like, ah, Python, it doesn't have types. And, I don't know, everything's runtime checked and so forth. Maybe, maybe we need to turn it into Java or something. You know, I, don't, I don't know, we need a different picture for that. So instead of the, 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 the green field of, uh, of, of in the background, you, you, you want Python to be more like the movie Brazil or something, okay. So, so one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that you might see in, in Python are, are like this move to put things like type annotations on the code. I don't know what you I don't know what you think about those. It's been around around it for a while. Uh, the, the only the only issue with those, I mean, aside from making it look like they're types, they don't actually do anything. Okay, so it's <laughs> right. So they they don't they don't do things. Um, they also have a have this this feature that they make Python look like it's compiled. And frankly, I just don't know whether that's a good thing. I I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I looked up the definition of compile in the Oxford English Dictionary, and this is what it came up with. This is a photograph of that. I mean, the, the first definition is fine, you know, to put together, but then what is the second thing, like, to plunder, pillage, rob, steal, snatch together, and carry off? Um, it's just not making me want to compile that much. Okay, so, okay, so, 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 so there's that. So what we're, gonna, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take a slightly different spin on this. We're gonna focus on checking, but what I'm going to focus on instead is the use of um, assertions and contracts. This is, um, this is, I think, often an overlooked programming technique for, for, for checking things. I admit that I'm probably a bit biased towards it, partly because of doing a lot with scientific computing. We used to use Python interactively a lot. And one of the nice things about contracts is that they actually are enforced. Like, so if you put that in your code, I mean, they will definitely fail. You get an error back, you know, and that was a really important thing for me working with, you know, working with physicists and stuff, you know, getting a useful error message back. So this is, this is what we're gonna focus on. And we're gonna, we're gonna make a framework for this. So, so we're gonna start with that. And we're gonna make a little, a little thing called contract here. This is sort of a, it's gonna be a framework for enforcing uh, basically assertion or contract. And one of our goals here is to use Python 3.6 features as much as possible. We're, we're essentially throwing ca caution to the wind here, and we're gonna, we're gonna use a lot of stuff. And uh, may, maybe a secondary goal will be to infuriate people as well. I mean, keep, keep, keep in mind that, you know, a goal of, um, of reinventing things is to upset people, you know, the naysayers and stuff, so we'll do a, we'll do a bit of that. Um, I guess with that, in, oh, 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 one other comment on this, on the talk here. Usually when people talk about frameworks, um, they have like talks with lots of pictures and stuff, you know, dogs and clouds and all, all sorts of stuff. Um, as far as I know, this might be the, the first talk where the pictures exist before the framework does. So I'm gonna have some inspirational photographs, you know, to go along with the coding here. We're gonna, we're gonna flip it around. And the, the, the first inspiration here is if you're gonna build a framework, you gotta start with inheritance. Partly because, you know, inheritance is really gonna mess with people. People tend to hate inheritance and classes and stuff. So what we're, what we're gonna base our framework on is basically this idea of being able to check a so-called contract. And here's an example contract. Maybe I have like an integer and what I'm gonna do is have a method that, that basically checks that. Okay, so we're gonna put our assert in there. Somebody last night was talking about the bad, badness of backslashes. I'm gonna use backslashes just because it, you know, that, that irritates people as well there. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so, so, so a contract's gonna look like that. And essentially this thing, um, you can give it a number and it will either work or it will fail. So if I put in, put in like 2.3, it will come back with a failed assertion. So the idea is that in my code, instead of having the, like the manual asserts like that, I'll, I'll have these, these contract checks. Okay, so we can check A, we can, we can check B. Okay, so we'll, we'll use that as kind of a, 
kind of, kind of a starting point. Let's, let's, let's make sure that it works here. Okay, so it so, so, so makes that bit. Now, having just one thing like that, okay, so one, one contract, that's not so exciting. So probably what we would want to do is make some other ones, like maybe, I don't know, make one for a string. Maybe we want to make one for a float or something. Okay, so you can, what we're going to do is kind of fill out this, um, you know, this 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 code with different different kinds of contracts that you can that you can use. Um, since we are working on framework code, I mean, keep in mind one of the goals is probably to use inheritance as gratuitously and as much as possible. Um, you might look at that and say, oh, it's a lot of a lot of a lot of repetition there. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll generalize this into something like a, like a typed class. And we'll, we'll do a bunch of inheritance on it. So what we're, what we're going to do here is essentially assert that the value is an instance of some type like that. And then we'll use an F string just to break the universe here. Okay, so um, keep, keep in mind we uh, we want, to, we want to use Python 3.6 features as much as possible. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that, and then what I'll, what I'll do is, is modify these things to um, just, just specialize it. Okay, so we're building up, building up our little, uh, little, little contract system here. I don't see anybody running for the exit yet, so I think we're... Uh, I think we're okay here. Okay, so so we've got 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 this little little contract thing. Keep in mind the way that those are going to work is um, you know you can you can try these things out and they should either fail or or pass. Okay, so you can you can you can try these try these things and and they'll either pass or give you an error. Now one interesting thing with with, with contracts is you're not limited to really type checking. I mean, this is actually one thing I kind of kind of like about about this contract idea is you could put other ideas in here, like maybe you have a contract that expresses the idea of something being positive. That's something that's actually a little bit difficult to express just in the concept of like a type necessarily. I mean, it's something, something else. So you could have things like that. You could have um, maybe a contract for something being non-empty. Okay, so same, same idea here. Maybe assert that the length of something is greater than zero. Yeah, I'm violating PEP 8 in a big way here, okay. I suppose that's good, good as well there, okay. So, um, okay, so you, could, you can have different, you know, different kinds of things here where um, you, can, you can try different things out, you know, like a positive check, you know, minus two, and it will, will fail. And then you can maybe even combine some of these things in your in your code, like maybe you want your um, your function there to have like multiple checks. So you have an integer and you have a you have a positive. I'm going to make sure that that actually works here. So okay, so that's that still works. If you do anything with bad values, though, um, sorry, I put the wrong key there. Um, it will um, it will crash then. Or if you give it like negative numbers, you'll 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 do that. Okay, so this is, this is kind of our starting point. We've got this, this contract system there. Oh, one thing that you might want to address at this point, by the way, is the fact that you've got these, like, these two things kind of combined, like integer and positive there. If you wanted to fix that, one thing that you could put into the code would, would be the um, super function. Yeah, you know, we're going to go through all our classes, and we're going to put a, we're going to put a super function in there. Um, the interesting thing about doing that is it lets me um, do things like this. Yes, multiple inheritance. But if you really want to make people angry about this, um, call this technique composition. Um, no, yeah, yeah, yeah the, um, no, no, you're you're, you're composing integer and positive together into one, um, one, one thing. So yeah, if you really want to make people angry, um, call it composition. Um, so it will, it will check two things. And then if, you, if, if, if that is not enough, like if they're still not angry, 
just claimed that super is the glue that holds composition together. Okay, so that's a little bit of a little bit of a, a little bit of an aside there, but uh, we're, we're essentially sort of making more more interesting kinds of kinds of contracts here, so you can you can clean that up. Now, one thing that 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 you might think about doing at this point, okay, so we've got this this contract, is maybe you don't entirely want to abandon the 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 attributes or the, t the, the annotations. I mean, Python does have this feature where you can annotate arguments. Like you could, you could come in here and say A is positive integer and B is positive integer like that. Maybe, you, maybe that is something that you, that you want to do. Like maybe you want to support that. The problem with doing that is, they, is that, again, they don't really do anything. So if you were to, if you were to do that, and you were to spell it right. I mean, I guess that's, uh, come on, Python. You're supposed to know that that was, uh, okay. Okay, so let, let, let's say you, um, you, you spelled that right there. They don't actually, they don't actually do anything. So they, like these annotations, they have no effect at all. I mean, essentially what, they, what happens is Python stores those as a attribute annotations, but it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't actually do anything with it. So if you wanted something to happen with that, one way to do it might be to do a decorator of some kind. So this is gonna be your crash course in writing a decorator. Okay, so I have to switch to the decorator picture here, uh, of, of post-it notes. Um, so what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do here, I'll kind of explain a few, few things. Uh, this first thing that I'm importing, if you've never written a decorator, is a, is a function that helps you uh, kind of preserve metadata about functions. And the other thing that I'm going to import here is something known as a sig the signature. And I'm going to write a decorator where basically you, you give me a function and I'm going to pull off the signature of that thing and I'm going to grab the annotations off. Now, let me, let me explain a couple things about this, this signature thing for, for a moment here. Um, this, this is something that you maybe have never seen before um, in code, but essentially what you can do with a, with a signature is you can use this to get like the calling signature of a function. It'll tell you like what the names of the arguments are and other things about it. And one kind of interesting thing about signatures is that if you happen to have some arguments sitting around, you can, you can do what's known as a binding step. Like you can bind arguments to a signature and then what you can do is look at it afterwards and it will tell you what you got. It will say, well, A is four and, five, and B is five. Now why that is useful to us here is I'm going to use that to enforce um, those contracts. So when you write a decorator, what you're doing is putting a wrapper around a function. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a, like a signature binding on those. And then once I've got that, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna walk through all the arguments and then I'm just gonna validate what was there. So like if, if the name is, is, is in that annotation dictionary. I'll look it up and I'll check the value. So what we're doing is taking those annotations and then kind of enforcing the, uh, enforcing the rules on that. So if, if I've done that correctly, famous last words, um, the, um, the function should now be enforcing those rules. Okay, so we've, we've kind of taken that, the, we've brought the annotations kind of, kind of back into the picture there. Uh, I, I, I could, but not in the time allotted. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of features that could be added here, so. Hopefully through multiple inheritance, but that, we'll take that <laughs> off, 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 offline there. Okay, so, so we've got the annotations. Now, having, having done that, yeah, yeah. We're, we're gonna dig the hole deeper here a little bit. Okay, so, so having, having done that, one of the things that you might want to do is think about like, well, how would this extend to something like a class definition? Okay, so let's say you're gonna, you're, you're making a game of some kind. You know, you have a, you know, a player, this is gonna be the worst game ever, but you had a, you know, player where you have a name and you have like an X, Y coordinate or something. And may, maybe you have some other methods on here, like the, o the only thing that you can do is move left and right. Okay, so let, let's say you had a class. Uh, one thing that, that you might think about here is just like, could you enforce type 
like the type stuff on this class. You know, you have the attributes, but Python doesn't really enforce anything. Like, I mean, you can set them to bad values, you can pass in all sorts of, you know, garbage, and it will basically blow up, and you, and you could say, well, is there some, is there some way I could do, do that? Um, one, of the, um, one of the techniques that you might know about is you could maybe enforce things by, through properties. This is something that's been around, uh, been around for a while. Essentially, what's happening with a, with a property is you can take over the dot. So maybe, maybe you do that. I need a picture for taking over the dot here. Okay, so you know, like a, a weasel riding a bird there. Okay, so, um, so if, you, if you were to do that and then try to, try to set the value to like a bad type, it would blow up because you've essentially taken over the, over the x attribute. But writing that just is horrible. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to write properties like that. Um, instead, what I would really like to do is use some of the secrets known by the framework builder. So if you've ever used things like Django or SQL Alchemy or other things, you may know that they work in a different way. One of the ways that they, that they can work um, is they can own the dot using something known as the descriptor protocol. This is not going to be a full tutorial on that, but essentially you can implement like get and set methods in a different way. And what I can, what I can do in here is, is essentially re-implement like the setting of an attribute. I can say, well, why don't you check it? And then once you've checked it, I'll reach down into the instance and set the dictionary to whatever the value is. Okay, so that's one of the things that I can do. And then the next thing I can do, which is a Python 3.6 feature, is I can put a method set name on here that sets the name of this thing. And those two things alone basically introduce a whole bunch of magic to this class. Um, what I can do in the class now is I can use my contracts. I can say name is non-empty string, x is integer. Keep in mind, if you've ever used something like Django, you've seen this kind of style being, being used there. So I'll put that on my class. And then all of a sudden, through magic, and I probably have a typo in, actually, what did I, what did I call it? Positive integer. Oh, I never did on non-empty string. Oh, okay. Well, well, we'll make that really quick. You can make anything really fast with multiple inheritance. So that's the, um, you never, never use too, too much multiple inheritance here. Um, and, and I have to fix the other spelling. But. Okay, so, so, so you have that. Um, and then what will happen at this point is you'll find that those rules are now being enforced. It's like, okay, so X is being enforced. If you tried to set the name to an empty string, it would crash. Or if you said the name to 123, it would crash. You've got this, you've got this type checking thing kind of added on there. That is kind of, it's kind of awesome. I mean, it didn't take a lot of code to do that, but you made this, 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 this like sort of little framework thing here. All right, so, so we've got that. We're still not kind of, kind of done with it though because one of the things that's really annoying is the difference between the GCD function and the player specification. I don't know if you can see that or not, but like up in the function, we've got a colon positive integer. And down here, we're doing name equals and then we have to call it as a function. I kind of hate that. So um, what we're going to do to fix it is we're going to use another Python 3 feature, which is basically class annotation. And you can say, well, it's a class annotation. Well, it's kind of the same thing as a function annotation. You can come in here and modify those two to attributes like that. And what happens with that? Okay, f f the first thing that happens is that you're going to lose all of your type checking. Those don't actually do anything. Um, they're, they're, they're exactly like the, the function version. Essentially, they get stored on the class, but they don't actually do anything at all. So that is a little bit, a little bit unfortunate. But we can fix that. Um, the, way, the way that you fix it is we're going to use inheritance. Yeah, big, big, big surprise there. Um, yeah, you can fix 
See, I'm going to be quoted on this talk. Like, you can fix everything with inheritance, or you can never have too much inheritance. And it's going to get people really riled up here. Uh, and what we're going to do to, to fix it is we're going to use yet another Python 3.6 feature, which is the ability to monitor classes that you're created. There's this new method where you can say init subclass. And what happens is this will fire anytime anybody inherits from you. So what I'm, what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to put in some code to, to basically instantiate the contract. So I'm going I'm to do, like for name uh, val, where I'm going to look at the annotations of this class. And I'm going to make a contract. This is kind of like doing the integer paren part there, okay, like that. And then I'm going to set the name on it to the name, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically put it back onto the class. Think of this as doing like a little bit of brain surgery on the class um, when, when you do that. And what is going to happen when you do that is now all of these annotations are essentially going to be enforced. It's, it's magic, essentially. What happens is this, this, this top-level class here can monitor the definition of the, of the child. It can go in and like fill in, fill in details. Um, we can do some other stuff while we're at it in here as well. Um, one, one thing that we could add is maybe a generalized init function. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assert that the, uh, like the length of the, of the arguments is equal to the length of the annotations. And then if it's not, we might as well just throw a gratuitous F string in here. Um, okay, so maybe that. Um, another thing that, oh, and then, uh, and then we're going to rely on another feature here, um, which is basically the ordered dictionary um, feature. Since, since all dictionaries are ordered, we might as well use that. So, uh, so what we're going to do here is basically iterate over the zip of those two things and set up attributes on myself. Okay, so you could, you could do that. Um, another thing that we might do while we're at it is maybe give it a nice wrapper string of some kind. This is also relying on the fact that dictionaries are ordered. So I'm, I'm, being, I'm being bad here. So, um, okay. And then we might as well use another F string while we're at it. So, um, no, F, F strings are really um, kind of cool. One of my favorite uses of them, by the way, is to do stuff like this. It's not so much output, but like making error messages and exceptions and stuff. So, so maybe, maybe we do that. Um, if we do that, then we can get rid of the init function. And we'll keep our fingers crossed that it actually works here. Okay, so we've got this, um, this thing where we can make a, make a player object. It has a nice wrapper string. It has attributes. And it has the type checking kind of turned on there. I don't know, how are, how are people doing with this? Is it still, hang, still hanging on there? We're, we're bending Python to, uh, uh, to, our, to, our, to our whims here. Um, we're, we're, we're not quite done with it yet. Um, one thing that you, that you may want to do is um, maybe you want to allow this. I mean, we did that stuff with like tamp type annotations earlier. Maybe we want to have that on a method, like enforce positive integer on the left and right thing. Turns out that we can do that as well if we come up to this init subclass thing um, and maybe apply the um, checked decorator. To do that, we can walk over the class dictionary and we can sort of say, well, you know, if something is callable, why don't we just um, replace it with a uh, with like a checked version of itself, I don't know. Apply a apply a decorator on that. Uh, if we do that, okay. Let's let's see if it still works here. Um, you still have the still have the type checking, but now the the methods also have their assertion kind of kind of going on there. So we're sort of we're sort of bending things even further 
with that. And keep in mind, there's a lot of Python 3.6 stuff, 3, stuff kind of in play here. There's like these annotations, there's you know, the, the ordering of dictionaries and other, other things. So, so we've, kind of, we've kind of taken it uh, to, to that level. I even did it without my special magic annotation slide there. Okay, so, so let, me, let, me, let me pause for a second. Let's see if uh, people are still with me. We're not done yet. We have, we're we're going to take this into like an even more dangerous territory in a, in a second here. Um, the, 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 the place where we're going with this next has to do with the problem that I've written all this code basically in a single file. I don't know whether you write all your Python programs in a single file or not, but probably not. So, um, so what's going to happen typically is that this player class is probably going to live somewhere else. You're going to have a different, different file um, where this, this gets used. And unfortunately, when you bring it to a different file, it's not going to work because I'm not doing all the import statement. Like, I have the base class, but in order to make this work, I'm going to have to suddenly put, like, a bunch of, um, I don't know, I'm going to have to start importing a lot of, and, I, and I, I'm look at that, I'm going to get really annoyed, and then I'm going to star import it. Nah, it's not good. It's, you know, okay, so, you know, you know I'll do the star import, and, and now I've just opened myself up for all sorts of abuse, you know, I mean, like, my coworkers are going to hate me for doing the star import. Um, your IDE is going to look at that star import, and it's going to put, like, some <laughs> highlight on it. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not good. Um, and, I'm going to do a solution to this. You're not going to like it. Um, but it's going to rely on the lesser known 20th Zen of Python item, which is more implicit is more than implicit. OK. I don't think you realize that there were 20 items in the Zen of Python. OK. So, um, so what, we're going to, what we're going to do for that, no, you're not going to, you're not going to like it. Um, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to this contract class here. I'm gonna make a dictionary. And I'm gonna use this, uh, this magic init subclass method again. Keep in mind that's a Python 3.6 thing. And the thing that I'm, that I'm going to do here is I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep a record of all the, cl all the classes that get defined. So it's not much code, but what that's gonna do is it will just keep track of all contracts, all contracts that have been defined through magic, just adding that. It's like class registration thing. Okay, so I'm, so I'm gonna do that. And then, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, naturally I'm gonna have to introduce um, a meta class. You knew that this was probably coming at some point. So um, if you haven't done meta classes before, let me, I'll, I'll talk about the gist of what, what I'm gonna do here. Um, so I'm gonna make a, uh, a meta class inherits from type. And one of the things that I'm going to define on here is something known as the prepare method. And normally what the prepare method does is it returns a dictionary. Now it turns out that this dictionary is what is used to execute the body of the class, but you're n you, you, can, you can do something else there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use something from the, chain, from the collections module known as a chain map. I guess it's just a, as a note, all serious magic in Python will eventually involve the collections module. So if you're, uh, you're not, not, not using that, you should probably, probably use that. Um, so, so what I'm gonna do is, is return a chain map that consists of an empty dictionary and that contracts thing that I just made earlier. Now, to, to, now just to illustrate what is going to happen here, normally when you define a class, like if I were to say like class player, you know, base, like that. Normally what is going to happen there is Python goes to this type function and it basically says, call the prepare method with the name of the class and then any base classes. And then a dictionary comes back. What I'm doing is I'm doing something sort of way sneakier where I have a prepare method where if you give me that same information, it, will come back with a magic chain map consisting of an empty dictionary and all of those contracts combined together. And you're like, hmm, okay, that's kind of, kind of interesting. What's, what's interesting about this chain map also is if you start modifying things in it, 
what ends up happening is you have two different dictionaries in play. There's, there's, there's kind of like the first one that holds the data that you're assigning, but then there's this second one that has all of the other things that you, um, that you, that you define there. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna return that back, and then I'm gonna do another thing with this, this meta class here. Not gonna like it, but that's, uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna discard the contracts part of this, and then I'll return like the normal, the normal use here. Okay, so, so I'm gonna do that. Um, now, what that's gonna allow me to do is something way, 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 way worse than the star import. Now, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna love this. Um, Keep in mind, like, what, what was the zen of Python? It was more implicit is more than implicit, I think, okay. So, so we're, we're, we're gonna do that. Um, what that's gonna allow me to do is just an import of base. There's no star import. And um, just based on that, it will magically work. Uh, and the thing that's really horrible about that um, is that none of these names are in the environment. Integer is not in the environment. Um, it's not in the um, it's not in the class. You just have these types, and they like somehow spontaneously exist in some weird fold of the space time dimension, essentially. Um, so instead of getting the, the 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 flame on your code when you do that, instead you're going to get um, you're going to get this, um, you know, sort of the you know that the head exploding image of, of, of sort of like well, where are these things? Um, where are these things coming from? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, so yeah, the, 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 the crowd is, it, it, it's like, okay, that's just, just, just horrible. Um, it turns out that you can, you can actually take this one step further as if you didn't think that was possible. Um, if, if you're willing to use the chain map in one other place, like in this decorator here, What I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the annotations of a function combined with a, um, a look at its global variables. You're not going to, yeah, this is, this is a really horrifically um, bad, bad idea. Uh, if, if, if I do that, I can come back here and do one other really sneaky thing, and this is also a Python 3.6 thing. Um, I can use what's known as a module annotation. So I'm gonna write an annotation called dx positive integer, and then I'm gonna take that off of my function. You see where this is going here, okay. Uh, so, so doing that, by the, by, by the way, this is sort of a reinvention of something that I did in the SWIG project called a type map, and if you've ever encountered that, you're gonna to wanna to chase me down and beat me later. Um, so uh, so, so, so what is, what's gonna happen with that? is that the, um, oh, I have a syntax error. Okay, let's, let's, oh, I'm missing a, miss, I'm missing a parenthesis. Okay, well, we'll come back, fix that. Uh, so if you, um, if you do that, you're gonna find that you, um, that you have all this kind of magic stuff going on. Like you can, you can check the types. Um, if you, if you call left with bad values, it enforces that. Uh, you look at the code and it's like, well, this is just nuts. Uh, what's, uh, what's happening? Es especially down here with like the left and the right. Somebody's like, how is that even being enforced? You know, so we get like a different head explosion, uh, <laughs> explosion image for, um, if, uh, for, for, for that. So, uh, so, so you can look at that. I mean, it, it, I, okay, so just going through that, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you necessarily copy this or, or, or do this, but it's, it's kind of typical of like, like what I find my experience in Python 3.6 to be lately, where it's like, this is just awesome. I mean, there's like all these like little awesome tools going on. Um, I don't think any of this really involved what I would call like a gross roundabout hack necessarily. I mean, like these, these things like a knit subclass method and so forth, I mean, those are just parts of the language and you can use it. You don't have to like, you know, they, they've been kind of driven by, by other things. So, you know, so, so, so people might look at that and say, well, that's, that's crazy. But you could also look at it and say, well, that's just 
that's just awesome. You know, we're back to green fields, and it's like it's cool. You can bend the language and in, in different ways. So, so we've got our got our got our framework here. Uh, we're almost at the end. Um, I, I just I get some comments on this. There are going to be naysayers to this whole. Uh, Oh yeah, 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 no, 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 no. People are gonna hate this big time. There was a big Twitter exchange recently, you know, like the, yeah, the, the life the life cycle of Python pro programmer. You know, you escape Java and C plus plus, and then you know, there's this whole thing where it's like, oh, I don't have to type types, and I don't need braces, and wait, now I can do all this magic, and I can do everything, and then, you know, the, 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 you know, he, Glyph is like, oh, what have I done? And then I, I offered some snide comments like, oh, you solved your problem. I don't know. Um, I, in, in defense of this, I will say, I, this might be kind of, I don't know, maybe kind of controversial. I don't think people would use Python if you couldn't do this. And no, I'm serious. And I think, and here's, here's, here's my rationale on it. All of these frameworks that people love to use, Django, NumPy, Pandas, all of that stuff, they do tons of magic to make that stuff work and to make it friendly for people you know, to, to do things. So, so, no, I would not advise writing like a meta class for a script or something, like I'm just like doing like some shell script thing. No, I'm not gonna do that. But that the ability to really kind of bend Python to different problem domains and stuff, I think it's a really cool part of, uh, part of Python. And I think it's really fun to kind of, kind of do it. So I would, I would definitely encourage you to go make the next fun prod package and have, have fun with this. And also not to be afraid of kind of reinventing things. I mean, you know, I'm not suggesting that any of these things necessarily need to be reinvented, but if you're sitting there looking at these packages, you, you, might, you might say, well, you know, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do HTTP because, you know, like request has already solved that problem or something. I mean, it's, I think there's always kind of an opportunity for rethinking things. I, I, actually, I crossed out packaging on here. Not, not so much that it doesn't need to be reinvented, but there's just no fun to be found there. So I don't, <laughs> don't wish the kind of, kind of, kind of wish that on anybody there. But that is, um, that is pretty much the end of this. I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, thanks for kind of listening to that. I hope that maybe this is a, you know, like, like a kickoff for other talks in the conference. I think people are talking about some of the more nitty gritty of some of these things, like you know, descriptors and Python 3.6 and meta classes and other other stuff. So I encourage you to kind of have fun at the conference, and, and that's it. I'm I'm basically done with it. So. I, I don't know if we're doing Q&A or not. How are we doing on time? Did I? Five minutes. Five minutes of Q&A. I don't even know if there's a mic floating around, if there is. Uh, we can talk loud. You can talk loud? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, let's see if there's any questions or uh, thoughts. It's yeah, okay, so <laughs> Oh, the presentation tech? Um, well, I, I, I can tell you that this is running in the terminal. Like, um, so essentially I have like, uh, you know, I have Python, you know, this, this is like an editor, so you can write code in there, and I can have it run. Um, the code itself it actually is running in the terminal. Yeah, that's the, the images is kind of a mystery here. Yeah, I, I, was, I was earlier. I was, I was, I think, like a couple of weeks ago, I was tweeting about writing my own text editor. This is that project. Uh, uh, now, this, the, the, this, the, the presentation, the presentation code is written in Python. It's, um, it is not pretty. I can tell. You that. Um, this is part of it. I mean, you can see like some of the imports on this. It's, it's, it's doing a lot of stuff with like term iOS like low level terminal control and other things. They, the, uh, the image stuff, I'm using a feature of iTerm2 to do inline images. So, but yeah, the, the presentation is, was a Python script running in the terminal. So you can, you can ask me about that, um, that later. I, I, I was actually trying to think about, you know, I've, I've done some live coding talks and I was like, huh, what could I do to really mess with people on that? Like, um, you know, the, uh, 
You know, there's, there, there's doing the talk in the REPL, but then there's this thing, which is like, maybe I should just do the REPL in the talk and like some, somehow fake people out, so. All right, let's see if there's other questions, other. Yeah, one over here. Uh, I, can, I can put it online, but I, I, I'm not aware, I don't know if anybody's written like a contract, like equivalent to that or not. A lot of the, a lot of the motion in with, with types is all focused around like the MyPy project, which they're probably gonna come running after me as well for, for stealing their annotations, but then that's okay. So. Okay, cool, cool. All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here. Uh, thank you very much. And